Hey, everybody. How's it going? Hope everyone's week is going well. So welcome to the eighth installment of Tasting Together. My name is Pat Fahey. I'm a Master Cicerone and I'm the content director for the Cicerone Certification Program. And we're just getting together to taste and talk about uh, a given style. That's what we're doing each week. This week we're doing Flanders Red Ale. Um, the goal is to have it be lighthearted but educational. Uh, if you can join us with the style we're talking about in hand, that's excellent. If you can't, that's totally fine too. You just probably won't have quite as good of a time as, as the rest of us do. Um, if you've joined us in the past, thanks for coming back. Last week we had a lot of time, a lot of fun tasting through and drinking, uh, in my case, a couple of Irish stouts. Um, if this is your first time here, one thing I always like to say up front is that uh, as you have questions, just throw them up in the chat. Uh, I won't necessarily get to them right when you put them up, but I've got somebody that's pulling them for me, so I'll be able to respond to them and I'll do my best to get to all the questions before we finish out the session. A uh, couple of procedural notes before we get started. Um, we've got a few exciting styles coming up in the next few weeks. Next week, I am tremendously thrilled. We'll be tasting Rauch beer, so smoked beer, uh, specifically kind of like Beechwood smoked beer from Germany. Um, but feel free to bring whatever sort of smoked beer you have available, uh, and we'll we'll talk about them all. Following Rauch beer, we'll be doing Imperial Stout, and then uh, week of June 3rd, we'll be doing Czech Premium Pale Lagers, like Pilsner or Kel, that general style. Um, if you guys have any styles you really want us to hit beyond that, let us know in the chat right now. I think next week we'll maybe put up uh, another poll to kind of get a feel for what people are interested in, but if you guys want to throw some things in the chat to shape what, what ends up in that poll, feel free to do so. Uh, and then we'll probably make decisions by the end of next week in terms of what styles we'll be talking about in June. Um, also, if you haven't tuned in yet, or if you aren't aware yet, we've been running this CBS prep course series. Uh, Master Sister Neil Witte has been doing that every Tuesday, Thursday, and he'll be doing those through the end of the month of May. I believe tomorrow is going to be uh, the eighth one. The other seven are all recorded on our channel, so you can check them out if you want to. Um, those offer a, a pretty solid foundation of a lot of the content at that first level of the program. Similarly, if you're a Spanish speaker, um, our business development manager for Latin America, Chema Mora, is also doing those on Facebook Live on Mondays and Fridays. So check that out if you haven't already. So without further ado, let's talk about the beer we came here to talk about. Uh, this week, we're drinking Flanders Red Ale. I myself am drinking the classic Rodenbach Grand Cru. Um, please let me know what you guys are drinking out there. If you haven't already, I've seen some duchesses. I've seen various Rodenbachs. I've seen, I, I want to say I saw somebody with a Lopoli. So let me know what you're drinking. Um, per usual, I, I've got this beer in a tulip glass. Um, this style actually is pretty well suited for a tulip glass. You know, different breweries glassware for this style takes a number of different shapes. Um, some of them are tulip shaped. Some of them are kind of more like a wine glass. Some of them trend towards kind of like a chalice or goblet kind of shape. But um, as is often the case with, with Belgian beers, usually something with a stem tends to work well. And uh, also like the, differences in those shapes often just come down to what the, the brewer thinks will make either make their beer look the best or will make their beer stand out the most. Um, so yeah, I would say if, if you're looking for like proper glassware for this style, 
something with a stem, but beyond that, you know, the exact shape is kind of up to up to your personal preference. So to talk a little bit about the history of this style. Um, Flanders Red Ale, as you might imagine, comes from Flanders, which is the uh, the northern portion of Belgium. Uh, it's a region where they speak Flemish, which is a dialect of Dutch. And that region, the entire Flanders region, has a pretty long history of brewing tart red and brown beers. Um, there isn't a lot recorded necessarily about the style specifically, if you go back a few hundred years, but a lot of people peg sort of the the current iteration of the style as we know it um, to the founding of Rodenbach Brewery. And Rodenbach really has come to typify uh, or serve as the archetype of this style. So we'll start kind of with a quick look at the the history of Rodenbach, which. Uh, was founded in 1821, I believe, coming up on 200 year anniversary. So Rodenbach is situated in the city of Roselar, which is in Western Flanders. And while the brewery was uh, founded in 1821, um, it was founded by, I believe, Pedro Rodenbach. Um, it wasn't until some years later that his grandson Eugene Rodenbach really sort of set the course for the type of beers that they would be making and the type of beers that they're making today. And one piece about that that I think is really interesting is that uh, a lot of the techniques that Eugene employed, uh, he started using after he'd been in England studying porter production. And when you look at like how Porter was historically made. It was a beer that was typically aged in wooden vats for a period of time. During that time, that beer would develop acidity, it would develop Brett character, and then it would be blended back into some younger beer to produce the finished product. We're going to talk about production of this beer in, in some detail, but like that's more or less the template for how this beer is made today. So it's kind of interesting to think that Flanders Red Ale of today may actually give a good approximation of what porters were like in the UK or in England like a couple hundred years ago, albeit not quite as roasty. If you want to like maybe really approximate it, like mix a little bit of stout into a Flanders Red just to get a little bit of that roast character. But I think it's really cool and interesting that this like Belgian style that seems totally unrelated may actually be a better touchstone to that historic porter style than the porters of today are. So how is this beer made? Um, just a second. So the way that Flanders Red is typically made, the base is usually going to be of uh, like a bit darker base malt, um, usually something like a Vienna or a Munich malt. Uh, in addition to that, they're also typically going to use some amount of caramel malts, which helps give the beer some of its color. Both the both that like darker base malt and the crystal malts that they use are going to contribute to the reddish, brownish, ruby hue that you see in these beers. So. Crystal malt, either mid-range crystal malt or sometimes special B, which is like a, stands for, uh, I believe, Special Belgique. Um, it's a it's a malt that's used in Belgium primarily uh, and is very, very dark for crystal malts. Gives a lot of like dark fruit, dried fruit type character. Um, and then in addition to that, one interesting thing that goes in the grist of a lot of these beers is going to be corn or maize, um, usually as much as like 20%. You know, I think a lot of people think about corn as like the realm of, of American lager production, but the brewers of this style will use a pretty significant portion of corn in the grist in order to get like the really, really high level of attenuation, that really, really uh, dry finish that, that this style typically has. So um, 
hops for the beer don't matter that much. Uh, this is not a style that has really any focus on on the hop character. Hops are usually going to be some like low alpha acid continental European variety. Where a lot of the character of this beer is built is in the fermentation. And the fermentation can go a few different ways depending upon the decisions of, of the brewery. In general, the beer is usually going to undergo primary fermentation in stainless steel first. And that primary fermentation could be just a Saccharomyces fermentation with more bugs added later. I know some breweries make it that way. I believe Rodenbach pitches culture of Saccharomyces as well as like Lactobacillus and Britannomyces and a few other organisms for that primary fermentation. Even still, Saccharomyces is going to be the, the main thing working, Saccharomyces being normal ale yeast. So that's going to be the main thing working during that initial fermentation in stainless steel. And the primary thing it's going to be doing is just like chewing through the sugar, producing alcohol, uh, getting the beer down to relatively low gravity. So after that primary fermentation, that beer could be finished. And in some cases like that, that I'm going to refer to it as young beer, that young beer does get used like that. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but also some of that beer is then diverted to aging in Oak. Uh, the sort of tradition for aging beers like this in wood, usually it's going to be aged, not in small format barrels or even like punchins, but oftentimes large oak fooders. And if you're not familiar with a, what a fooder is, it's basically a really big wooden barrel. Um, you know, I've seen in the US, like I think the smallest fooder I've seen is maybe 10 barrels, a US barrel beer being 31 gallons, so like 310 gallons. It's possible that they make smaller fooders than that, but I, I don't know that I've seen any smaller than that. At Rodenbach, uh, their smallest fooders are about 120 barrels. Their largest are like 550 barrels. So these are tremendously large oak vats that they're using for aging the beer. And that size really does play a very important role in the way that the flavor develops. I'm going to like sidebar a little bit into the impact that barrel size has on, on flavor development during aging. But what you get as the barrels get larger and larger is you get a like less and less surface area of the beer exposed to the wood. And so the result of that is that aging something in a smaller barrel is going to give you more barrel character if there was like more if there was some previous liquid in that barrel, you'll get more of that character in a smaller format barrel. And then also wood is slightly porous. It, it allows some oxygen to come into contact with the beer. So that oxidation and, and development of those sorts of flavors, it's gonna happen a lot faster in a small barrel than it would in something large like a fooder. So that beer that we were talking about, that beer that has gone through primary fermentation, typically get sent to these oak fooders, usually for about two years. Um, you know, the at Rodenbach, at least, the brewmaster is like tasting through those fooders as they kind of come to maturity and makes the decision based on the flavor profile of when that beer is ready. So it could be 18 months, it could be 30 months, but on average about two years in wood. During that time, you have... You know, Britannomyces slowly working and producing flavors, lactobacillus acidifying the beer. You have, as is typical in, in Flanders Red Ale, some amount of acetobacter action producing a little bit of acetic acid that gives the beer kind of a vinegary sharpness. So at the completion of that aging period, the brewer has a number of options in terms of what they do to make their finished beer. And once again, like a lot of the a lot of the specific practices that I'm talking about come from Rodenbach. Um, other producers of Flanders Red Ale do things slightly differently. But with Rodenbach, for example, what they will do typically is they will blend that fooder aged beer, I'll just call it fooder beer, with the young beer, basically the beer that's gone through primary fermentation and stainless steel, but hasn't been allowed to develop a lot of acidity or kind of like 
earthy, barnyardy Brett character. And as a result of that, by varying the amount that they put into uh, of each that they use in the blend, they're able to produce pretty significantly different beers. So I saw somebody in the chat say that they were having a Rodenbach Classic. Rodenbach Classic is typically about 75% young beer, 25% fooder beer. So the acidity on that beer is pretty, uh, it's pretty soft. There's not a lot of that really intense sour character in that beer. In Rodenbach Grand Cru, that beer is typically going to be one third of the young beer, two thirds of the fooder beer. So it's got a lot more of that acidic character. It's got a lot more funk. It's got a lot more depth to it. Um, and then Rodenbach, I know, also releases uh, Rodenbach Vintage, which typically is going to be 100% of that fooder aged beer. And once again, that's going to have even more acidity and, and depth of character from that longer, just from the fact that more of the beer in that package has spent a while developing. Like I mentioned, though, you know, different breweries will do it different ways. Some breweries may focus more on blending different fooders in order to uh, produce the characteristics that they're looking for out of that beer. Um, some brewers, especially if they're like a smaller producer outside of Belgium, and you know, Flanders Red isn't the only thing that they do. Uh, they may instead be producing it in smaller format barrels, like just like a standard wine barrel size or a larger punch in. And so, in that case, they're going to get a lot more wood character out of the beer. Um, one of the things, like, just talk about Rodenbach again one time. Um, Rodenbach is one of the most fascinating breweries that I've ever had the opportunity to visit. Um, you know, they have, and, and there aren't a lot of them on the bottle, but you've, you've probably seen the pictures of the fooders there. That's like one of the most iconic images of beer aging in wood. They have kind of the red bands that go around the fooders they have these just enormous fooders of, of beer aging. And the thing is, is like, they have almost 300 of them. Like it's just hall upon hall, multiple floors of beer aging and fooders. It's, it's one of the most incredible things. And some of the fooders go back all the way to the founding of the brewery. You know, they have fooders that have been in continuous use for 200 years. I think is just like such a cool element of, of that brewery, but also of beers that are produced in this style. Just a second, getting thirsty. So um, one really quick thing I want to talk about before I dig into the flavor profile. I mentioned at the outset that Flanders has long been famous for their red and brown tart beers. And I want to talk about the fact that uh, a lot of style classification bodies, BJCP included, uh, classify two different beer styles that sort of fit into this general uh, family of, of Flemish tart ales. Um, so you have Flanders Red Ale and you have Oud Brune, which used to be called Flanders Brown Ale. So you had Red Ale and Brown Ale. And the thing is, is like Belgians in general are not huge on the concept of beer styles. So in Belgium, it's very much not a thing that like if you were sat a Belgian down and tried to be like, can you talk to me about the differences between Flanders Red and Oud Brun? They'd be like, what is your problem? Um, and I think Ray even has a story of, of talking to Peter Bockhart about that question and getting like yelled at over the phone just because he was like, there is no such thing as the Flanders red style. So what you'll see on labels of beer produced in Belgium uh, is that sometimes they'll feature both terms. So, you know, what are, what is BJCP and other organizations getting at when they talk about these as two different styles? What it largely boils down to is Flanders red ale is sort of, typified by the products that are produced by Rodenbach, 
the Oud Brune style is typified by the products that are produced at Leafman's, which is a brewery located in Eastern Flanders. Um, and some of the key differences that you see between those two beers, uh, the grist tends to be a little bit different. You know, take like Leafman's Gutenbond, which is their Oud Brune. Instead of using like a dark base malt, it's usually Pills base malt. Still gets a bunch of crystal malt and usually some corn as well. But then they use like black malt to get the color in those beers. Not a lot, but a little bit. So that changes the flavor profile a little bit. The bigger difference is that Oud Brune is typically going to be, if it is aged, it's going to be aged warm in stainless steel rather than an oak. So that really shifts the types of flavors that you see produced in that beer. And oftentimes you're not going to see development of uh, any acetic acid or vinegar character in those beers. So to talk about the flavor profile of this beer, this beer uh, is drinking quite nicely right now, I will say. Um, Flanders Red Ale, and this one in particular, leads with a lot of fruit character. You know, the first thing I kind of get on this beer is like a black cherry, tart cherry kind of character, but there's a lot of other fruit underneath it. Um, you know, you get some amount of kind of like currant or like dried fruit notes. Uh, like I get a little bit of plum, prune, kind of raisiny type characteristics out of it. Uh, Avery and I were tasting a bottle of this about an hour ago. And, uh, one of the things that she remarked was like, it almost has a flavor of like grape candy. Like she said, off brand grape Jolly Rancher. So there is, uh, that kind of plays in line with, uh, that sort of dark and, and dried fruit notes that you get out of it. But underneath all that fruit, there's like a pretty significant caramel and almost toffee like malt character like there's which really does give the impression of sweetness to the beer um, and the beer also does have a little bit of sweetness i know that it is back sweetened a little bit to balance the the acidity of it um, so in balance with all of that fruit character you've got caramel you've got maybe a little bit of toffee you also have the acid component though. And that's obviously a significant component of these styles. It's primarily lactic driven, but Flanders Red typically does have a little bit of acetic character. Acetic is that like vinegary note. It's a little bit sharper, a little bit harsher. In, in this beer, it presents almost kind of like balsamic vinegar. Um, I've had versions of this beer where the acetic was like really strong and kind of unpleasant. Uh, in this case, it's it's actually a little bit softer than than it was the last time I had it. So it's it's been very enjoyable to sit here and sip. Um, acetic acid, especially you know in in American sour brewing, is one of those things that I think early on when people were sort of experimenting with brewing acidic beers, they're like, yeah, it's great. It makes you know obviously it makes you it lets you know that it's sour because it's like harsh and sharp and over time, especially like the last five to 10 years, brewers, at least in the US, have very much tried to move away from acetic production. You know, if you talk to people who produce wood aged beer, the number one thing that they'll talk about as a reason to, to dump a barrel is, is acetic acid presence. So at this point, brewers are, are kind of trying to avoid that characteristic. And I, and I can think of even like brewers stateside that make their own example of Flanders Red Ale that 10 years ago had pretty significant acetic character to them. And at this point do not because they've tried to dial that back since they consider it kind of to be a harsher undesirable flavor. This beer, one of the things, if you read the style guideline on this beer, is that like sometimes you'll get some amount of wood character in, in them, either like tannic character or um, maybe even like vanilla notes other or other woody type characteristics from the barrel aging. With this beer, like I talked about, the barrels or the fooders that are used to age it are so large 
and have been used so many times that they're not really imparting much in the way of oak character. So I don't pick up a lot of tannin or a lot of wood character in this beer. Um, it's something you might see if you had one that was aged in a smaller format barrel, but not really in this. As always, last thing I want to talk about is pairing for Flanders Red. And I think that this is a really versatile beer to pair with. I really like pairing with sour beers. I think it can be a lot of fun. Um, for beers that are like really, really assertively acidic, sometimes it, it becomes so much that it's like you can't even find a dish that can stand up to it. But uh, the acidity of this beer is more balanced. It's more tempered. It's certainly significant, but it's not over the top. So the classic pairing for, for Flanders Red Ale is a Belgian dish called Carbonade Flamant. It's sort of like a Belgian beef stew. So it's like really rich and fatty beef in sort of like a, a gravy type sauce. And I mean, this beer is like perfect in that context. You've got the acidity kind of working to cut through the fat that's present. I, I find personally that like a lot of, uh, and you see this in like the way that people construct dishes, like a lot of rich meats often will be paired with something like a, some fruit character, like a cherry compote or something like that. So those dark fruit notes tend to play really nicely with those types of meats. This beer brings those fruit flavors while also sort of relieving the palate. So Carbonade Flamande is, is an obvious one. I love this with like just about anything fatty. Um, when I was thinking about the pairings for this, I was reminded uh, we do this course a couple times a year in Chicago called the Road to Cicerone Boot Camp, and we partner up with uh, the Hop Leaf. It's a restaurant here, restaurant and bar here in Chicago, um, Belgian beer bar, one of the best in the city. Truly, just like a, it's such a phenomenal place, and their food is incredible. And so we partner up with them every time we do that class and they put on like a six course paired dinner for us. And I remember one year, it wasn't a Flanders Red, but it was a beer that kind of similar. It was a beer from Brewery Taru um, that was acid driven, I think had some raspberries in it as well. And they paired that up with a chicken liver mousse and just like it, it something that rich, that fatty and that kind of gamey just works so well with the bit of acidity here, the the fruit character. Like I said, it's just like cherry compote right on top of, of that pate. Um, I can think of also at Hop Leaf years ago, like they oftentimes will have this dish that's like, uh, it's just like cooked sausage and uh, like white bean stew. And it's just rich and it's like everything you want on a cold, Chicago winter night and having that alongside a Cuvée de Jacobin Rouge, another example of a Flanders Red, just a, like a total transcendental pairing. Um, another thing to think about with this beer, uh, Avery brought up when we were talking about this, that Flanders Red is about as close as you get to red wine when it comes to beer. And like Michael Jackson, the beer writer is famed for having described this as the Burgundy of Belgium. Um, anything that you would think of that kind of works well with red wine, or when you think about the characteristics of a red wine that make it suitable for pairing, um, this beer brings a lot of the same things to the table and some extra things in that it's carbonated and it has those kind of like caramel toffee flavors that are going to sync up well with a lot of dishes in a way that red wine couldn't. So like a medium rare steak, like this would sing. Uh, turn to ethnic food. I think like, like Mexican food could work really well. There are a lot of different things in there sticking with kind of like the different fatty type things. I think like pork carnitas where you get that nice like caramelized sear, but it's still super fatty work really nicely with this. Uh, al pastor tacos where you've got like a little bit of a pineapple character playing within with the fruit in here. I think uh, mole would be nice. A lot of times these beers, especially some of the darker ones will have a little bit of a chocolate character and that could work really nicely with something like that. Turn maybe to 
Asian food, something Chinese, like I think like a five spice pork belly um, or, or even like pork fried rice would probably be really good with this. But I do want to say like, it doesn't have to all be just like super rich, super fatty things. Like this is delicate enough that it could work with something like a, even like a salad, um, especially if that salad had some punchier elements to it, like maybe a little bit of blue cheese or like a bacon crumble or something like that. So that's all I have to say before I, before I dig into the questions. First question. This is a simple question. This is more of a, an English question than anything. So uh, Jake asked if I could explain why it's sometimes called Flanders and sometimes called Flemish. Um, Flanders is basically, I'm going to try and get my like names of English things right. Flanders is the noun, Flemish is the adjective. So Flanders is the region. Um, and I suppose like think like America, American, Flanders, Flemish. So in truth, like these should probably be named like Flemish Red Ale rather than Flanders Red Ale. But that's the name that it's been given. Flemish is an adjective that can be used to describe both the language spoken in Flanders, but also just like anything from Flanders could be called Flemish. Chris asks, with some shared history with Porter, was there ever a period with direct style overlap? I'm assuming you mean like, was there ever a period in time where these beers would have existed and tasted somewhat similarly? Um, and as far as I know, the answer would be yes, at kind of like the early stages of, of Rodenbach existing. Um, that was kind of the tail end of, of Porter popularity or Porter's like really height of popularity in, in England. Um, over the course of the 1800s, Porter kind of fell away as, as the most popular beer and was uh, supplanted by IPA and bitter and other pale beers. Let's see. Scott Bales asks, is Flanders Red Ale a unique Red Ale or are there similar brewing techniques used by others? Maybe like uh, Smithick's Irish Red or American Red Ales. Um, in general, like, it's an interesting question. When I think about different beers out there that are labeled like Red Ales, like really, and this, this almost sounds like overly simplified, but really the only thing that unifies them is their color. Um, and usually that color is accomplished either by use of crystal malts, which would be the case in this beer and the case in like an American red ale, American red ale is usually going to be something like an American pale ale or an American IPA, but brewed with some crystal malt to give it like a reddish hue. Um, Irish red ale, something like Smithix is, uh, as far as I know, it's a small amount of black malt. And, you know, black malt or roasted barley, interesting ingredient in that, like, if you use it at 5%, your beer is going to be black. If you use it at like half a percent to 1%, your beer is going to be reddish um, and, and won't necessarily be super roasty. It'll just have kind of like a, uh, maybe like a light nutty char note to it. So, um so the answer is like, no, there's not a lot that really unifies those styles outside of their color. And, and that's going to come down to largely to the ingredients that are used. James asks, if a brewer made a red ale, but it got infected and created a tart character, can it be considered a Flemish red ale? I would say probably not. I've definitely, I haven't judged homebrew competitions in a long time. And I've had some fantastic beers judging in homebrew competitions, but I also recall like, I don't think it exists in the BJT, uh, BJCP guidelines anymore, but there used to be a category called like experimental Belgian. And what it usually seemed like was, was beers that got entered there were like, people were like, well, I tried to brew this beer, but then it got infected. And so now it's Belgian which is not true, 
Um, you know, just having acidity alone does not make the beer fit into the style. I would say, you know, it's one of the things that I really admire about the way Belgian beer generally is is made, and it's hard with with as eclectic as the beers of Belgium are to draw like broad brush statements. But one of the things that I think a lot of Belgian brewers really strive for is to produce beer that is very well balanced, very well integrated. And in order to do that, you need to have a thoughtful approach from the get-go. Um, I I feel like happy accidents like that are not a thing that happens in Belgium as much as they might happen in, in other parts of the world. So nah, you could enter it in a competition as a as a Flanders Red Ale, but I don't think it would do very well. Michael asks if the young or old beers ever appear on their own. Old beer, definitely. Um, like I mentioned with Rodenbach, you know, Rodenbach Vintage is an example of that old beer um, being served. Outside of that, I think it would depend on the brewery. I don't think that Rodenbach packages or even serves their, uh, like just their straight up young beer. But some brewery might, not 100% sure on that. Ophelia asks if the role of the blender plays as large of a role in this style as in Lambic. That's a little subjective. I would say no. Um, you know, one of the things in, in producing these beers, you do have the same sort of thing where like different fooders are going to develop differently. Um, when I was there, I was lucky enough to get to taste through uh, a, several of the fooders and at least for me, not like tasting that beer all the time, they were similar. There were slight differences, but um, versus like tasting different barrels of Lambic, the differences were not quite as pronounced. So I'd say, yes, the role of the blender in producing these beers is still tremendously important. Um, but I, I think the, you know, the Finnish flavor profile of Lambic style beers like Goose is the blender plays a more important role in shaping those beers. Let's see. Can you touch on ethyl acetate in Flanders Red? So ethyl acetate is a flavor compound that's kind of, smells like nail polish remover. Um, and it's, it, it is an ester. Esters are formed by the combination of an alcohol and an acid. Uh, and when you look at the name of an ester, like it, it tells you what's coming together. So the first part is the alcohol, ethyl. So in, in this case, ethanol. Second part is the acid. Acetate is acetic acid. So ethyl acetate comes about as a combination between ethanol and acetic acid. All beer has some ethanol. Beers with elevated levels of acetic acid oftentimes are going to lead to elevated levels of ethyl acetate. And when you get really high levels of ethyl acetate, like that's also typically viewed as a flaw. That's something brewers generally don't want. It's it's kind of solventy and and uh, like I said, like nail polish remover at higher levels. So this beer has a little bit of ethyl acetate, and at lower levels, it it serves as just kind of like a potentiator for other esters. It just makes other esters more apparent. Um, but at high levels, it can get really unpleasant. So I would say if it's present and you're like, whoa, at the last date, it's not a good thing. Let's see. I've got a doozy of a question from Chris about Solera, whether or not Solera has an effect in Flanders Red Ale production. Can you expand on Solera? I am not an expert on Solera method, but I'll talk about it as I understand it. So Solera method, um, I believe is something that comes from sherry production. And it's what it involves is typically drawing some liquid out of a wood vessel and then replacing that with additional liquid. So basically at, at all times you have some amount of liquid retained from, from the previous batch. Um, and, you know, in sherry production, my understanding is that it's like, you'd have like a stack of barrels 
And basically you'd always like pull from the bottom for production. And then you pull from the layer above that to fill what was taken out. And then from the layer above that and layer above that. Um, so that involves like a lot of transfers. That's definitely not something that's happening really in, in much of any beer production because it introduces a ton of oxygen. Sherry is a product that has like a lot of oxidized character. Most beer, you're not looking for a lot of oxidized character and introduction of oxygen is the biggest culprit behind acetic acid development. So you don't have like tons of transfers like that. What you might see is you might see some breweries that will like, especially if, they ha if they're using fooders, um, they will pull some of the beer out of the fooder and then will refill. So you still have a portion of the original beer left in there and then fermentation restarts on that new beer that was added. That's something that some brewers do. My understanding is that in Belgium, that's not as common. In Belgium, usually when they're blending, they'll blend entire fooders at once. Um, but uh, different people will do it different ways. Let's see. Best temp for serving this beer. Um, I want this in like, I don't know. I don't want it to be super warm necessarily. Like I don't want it to be 50 degrees Fahrenheit, but it does tend to open up a little bit as it warms. So maybe 43, 45. Um, or you can like put it in a glass as it's cold and sip it as it warms over the course of talking to people about it for an hour. And it's enjoyable throughout. Um, from Bon Beer Voyage, good to see you. Um, question about how often Belgian friends have said that you must go to the coast and have the shrimps in Rodenbach. I haven't been told that a lot of times. I must just like not be spending enough time with the right people. Um, but I could get down on some some shrimps and some Rodenbach. Like I. I Thinking about it on paper, like it doesn't necessarily sound incredible to me. Like I feel like almost the, just like the acid and fruit character of the beer might play strangely with that. But given that it's a clearly a recommended pairing, I definitely, it, maybe it does work super well. And that's one of the things I don't get the opportunity to talk about with pairings here that often, because I just kind of pull up a hit list of what I think works really well. Um, the most unexpected pairings are usually the most fun. Uh, if you find pairings where it's like, wow, I really didn't expect that to work, but it did. Like those are the most knock your socks off pairings for, for people. So like, I guess I'm going to have to try the shrimps in the Rodenbach now. Uh, something to look forward to. Kyle asked, can you make a kettle sour of a Flanders red? If so, how would you taste the difference between that and a fooder aged beer? I would say no. Um, the uh, whole idea behind kettle souring is you're just building acidity quickly by having a lactic acid fermentation that's occurring on, on the hot side. You're basically using your kettle as a fermenter um, and you're accomplishing a lactic acid fermentation over the course of a day or two. Kettle sours produce beers that have clean lactic acidity, but not much else in the way, like they don't develop the depth and complexity that you get out of aging a beer in wood. And there isn't really any way to replicate that without doing it. Um, you know, the main differences that you'd see, like you get development of Brett character in these beers over time. You get slow, gentle oxidation of this beer over time, which you definitely would not see in a kettle soured beer made in stainless. So you could, you know, use a similar grist and you could kettle sour it, but it would just be like a, it probably wouldn't have quite as interesting a bouquet of like fruit character. It definitely wouldn't have any wood character. It wouldn't probably have the depth of like caramel and toffee and those sorts of things because well, you can get some of that from crystal malt. Some of that also just develops as the beer oxidizes. So uh, you could make it. I don't think it'd be as interesting. 
Let's see. Will acetic acid presence become stronger the, with longer time spent in the bottle? Um, maybe, maybe is, is the short answer. Um, for a beer like Rodenbach, not necessarily. Um, it's so for acetic acid to happen, you have to have a couple things. You have to have ethanol, which the beer obviously has. You have to have oxygen and you have to have acetobacter. And acetobacter thrives in the presence of oxygen and will convert ethanol into acetic acid. Um, for a beer like Rodenbach, Rodenbach is pasteurized. So don't think there's much in the way of like living anything present in it. Over time, um, you will get oxygen ingress, like oxygen can migrate through the, like the crown bottle barrier slowly over time. So like if it's held for a long time, you'll get additional oxygen in the bottle. I don't think that will necessarily lead to increase in acetic acid if you don't also have acetobacter present. But that does make me think of like some really, really old lambics or gooses that I've had where they've been aged for like 10 years or like I, I have a recollection of trying a bottle of goose that was like 25 years old. And it was real vinegary. Like it, you, you get oxygen ingress, there's still living stuff in there that can produce acetic acid that will lead to an uptick in, in the level of acetic character present. Sally asks, how long does a fooder last? indefinitely um you know over like i mentioned some of the fooders at rodenbach have been in use for a couple hundred years occasionally you can you might have issues with a fooder where you might get like a leaky stave or like um you might unfortunately have a fooder develop like mold or or maybe it's not producing the flavors that you want um, in the case of Rodenbach, like they have a cooperage on site. So they, if, when they have a fooder that maybe has a leaky stave or that they want to sort of revitalize, they will take the fooder to the cooperage and will repair it and continue using it. I know in, in the case of, um, those fooders where they're so big, like the staves are really, really thick and occasionally they'll just go and they'll basically like shave down the interior a bit just to expose um, fresh wood. But fooders, when properly maintained, can last a really long time. I don't know that there is like a definite end point for them if they're if they're taken care of and then repaired as as issues crop up. Let's see. Anne asked, how is it back sweetened? Um, God, I remember talking to Rudy, who's the brewmaster at Rodenbach, and he like told me the term for it, but I my understanding is it's just kind of like a uh, sugar solution, probably like a Belgian candy sugar-esque thing that they use. And uh, obviously, if you just, with a beer like this, if you just added sugar at the end, it would continue fermenting. The beer is pasteurized before the sugar is added. Um, so there's nothing really living going on. And it's not like a tremendous amount of, of sugar, but they, the way he described it to me was that it's necessary in order to always dial in the, the precise amount of perceived acidity that they want to have in the beer. They use a little bit of sugar to, to balance it out. Let's see. I've got a question. Are vintages common releases and is aging a vintage in bottle advisable? Um, Some breweries will do vintages uh, of this beer. Really the one that I can think of that does that is Rodenbach. Um, Rodenbach does their like labeled vintage series of these beers where it's all coming from. Uh, my understanding is it's coming typically from a single fooder. Um, I don't, I can't think of other breweries making Flanders Red Ale that do like vintage releases like that. So no, I would say it's not super common with regard to aging them. Um, that's kind of up to you. Uh, I would say once again, uh, these beers are not alive when they're packaged. They don't have like living critters in them. So they're not necessarily 
you're not going to develop fermentation flavor or maturation flavors in that way. All that you're really developing is oxidation character. Um, I've said this like a lot of times over the last several weeks of doing these, but like in general, I'm very against aging beer. I think even for styles like this or goose, like in a lot of cases, it tastes best when it's fresh. Um, but that's my personal opinion. So if, you know, the best way to know when, uh, whether or not you like a beer aged is to grab a few bottles of it and taste them as they age and see whether or not you enjoy the beer aged more than you enjoy it fresh. So you can definitely try aging vintage bottles of it. I find that like the fruit character falls off a little bit and it develops a lot more of that kind of like caramel type oxidation character. And at that point, like the balance starts to get a little wonky. I don't like it as much. So I try to drink them as, as fresh as I can get them. And I've got a question from Kyle. Does Enterobacter play a role in this beer? If so, how? No, not to my knowledge. Uh, and actually, I, I, will, I will just say like definitively no. Um, Enterobacter, the only style that really Enterobacter can impact or does impact is, is Lambic type beers, beers that are made uh, using spontaneous fermentation. Um, and Enterobacter really can only grow in wort at the very, very beginning of fermentation, because even like the amount of drop in pH that you see from a Saccharomyces or like an ale yeast fermentation is going to drop it down to a level where Enterobacter can't survive. So, you know, for these beers where they're getting primary fermentation and stainless steel done in like a, you know, sanitary way, Enterobacter never really comes into the picture. And that is all the questions that we have. So um, I want to thank you guys very much for coming by and drinking Flanders Red with me. I had a great time talking about it. And I hope you will all join us next week to talk about Rauch beer, which is a, a style or category of beer near and dear to my heart. Um, if you haven't had a lot of smoked beer, give it a shot. It's It's weird and it's polarizing, but I think they're freaking awesome. So cheers guys. Thanks for another great week.